Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, your host of the weekly Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. Uh, this week we have actually a really exciting set of sessions. Um, Federico Lucifredi gave us actually two sessions and I'm going to present it as two videos. So um, video one is about using Raspberry Pis and building a Raspberry Pi cluster. Um, so he'll show you how he's done that and what he put together for that. And then he has a whole separate topic, another 20 minutes, about uh, supercomputing and how you optimize distributed algorithms and how they work and, and all sorts of amazing stuff. I split it into two videos. Pick and choose which one you want. Uh, both were fantastic. So um, definitely check it out. If you know somebody who should be speaking, please contact me. Uh, we are always looking for speakers who want to talk and share some knowledge for 45 minutes on a Tuesday afternoon. Thanks. So uh, uh, my name is Federico Freddy. I work at Red Hat and um, pretty much spent my entire career in open source. Um, I worked for SUSE, for Canonical, and now for Red Hat. Uh, so you can collect <laughs> you can you want from me, I guess. So like a musical um, chairs thing? <laughs> <laughs> Running out of the solutions here. Um, so, um, no, it actually is a distinct privilege to be able to to work um, in open source pretty much the entire time. So, that, that was cool. And uh, the areas that I've been focusing on were primarily systems management and uh, now storage. Where I, what I do at Red Hat is self storage. So, um, there is quite a bit of clustering involved, and that's where the, the background for the talk comes from. The idea is that uh, we'll build quite a few clusters for, um, for uh, testing stuff or for development reasons, and then I sometimes like to push things into, uh, into uh, the edge and see how small can I make them or how cheap can I make them or things like that. And so, one thing that we wanted to look at are uh, Raspberry Pi clusters, and um, and from one thing came another. And uh, one thing that um, came out of this was, well, effectively, you can use Raspberry Pi clusters as small uh, supercomputers in the sense that you can develop code that you would mean for supercomputing applications on a Pi um, or on a Pi cluster. And get your MPI things worked out before you move them to the to the real machine. And but I think it's it's just um, a cute little way to introduce um, uh, to introduce clustering. And um, um, yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of interest. So <laughs> let me see if I can manage to figure out how Zoom will let me share the screen because you should have permission. Here, best off. Yay, right. it's coming. There you go. We can see it. The book will sleep clutter desktop. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you the, the speaker view of the talk since uh, I didn't attach an external screen, but I guess that's, that's fine. Now, um, the idea is generally that this is a talk for, um, for an intro level audience uh, of people that are not familiar with clustering and give them an idea of how to build one that's actually um, relatively well made and hygienic and um, a good starting point for students that want to learn about supercomputing, but also a reasonable um, starting point operations wise. Um, well, I did, the, uh, I did do the introduction already and here are some products that I worked on. I think the part that uh, Rob will like is the is the brown bag. Uh, oh, look at that! Yeah, logo that I made for, uh, for his event series. Usually, there is the conference logo there, and I thought it would be more appropriate. <laughs> um, every time I have a hardware talk, there is a no liability disclaimer. In part because it's necessary, but mostly because it's funny. And um, in the interest of serve, saving time. Let's just go um, to the pictures of the cluster so that we can actually see what the cluster looks like. So, uh, no, that's not relevant. 
So these are pretty much the parts. This particular cluster is built uh, using uh, uh, an architecture from Pico Cluster, um, a small company, I believe, based in Utah, that uh, prepares kits for building clusters with Raspberry Pis and, and other um, um, systems on module um, Linux computers. I believe I've they're always, all on base. I've always described that as Pico. I hadn't thought to call it Pico. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure how they uh, how they read it. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so this is the smallest one, um, the three node, uh, but it's with the newest boards. There are Raspberry Pi 4s with uh, four gigs of RAM. I have another one that's uh, also a, Pi, uh, a Pico 3, but it's uh, done with, um, with um, Raspberry Pi uh, 3 boards. And um, there is a little bit of difference I will show you. So just go through, going through the um, setup um, pictures that I took at the time pretty quickly. Um, these are just stacked using, um, using um, standard yes. connectors nothing um, too unusual. Uh, then there is the power distribution board, which is custom made by the uh, by Pico cluster. Um, in this case, the board has to distribute USB-C power. So uh, the power distribution board is a little bit um, fancier <laughs> than usual. Cool. Uh, and it has a, a connector for the, um, uh, the various fans and um, in this particular model, model, they integrated the um, uh, the switch as well. So they um, they opened up a switch and they just sent you as part of the kit the switchboard, and it goes on one of the sides of the cluster. Then you have um, a big tail cable to bring out the HDMI and uh, a little custom power supply to power the whole thing, so that you have it built with a single. Uh, with a single power source, which is actually surprisingly handy. Uh, this is the entire power uh, stack. So one, um, the, um, the cable that you see running across the stack of boards is the one that powers the, the power distribution board. And then there is um, the three cables on the left, which are the, the power switch and the connector to the, uh, to the standard um, PC power supply. And here is another view of the same thing. And at this point, we're pretty much complete. Uh, we have to do some assembly of the sides of the cluster and bring the power to the switch. But um, there isn't a whole lot of work to do to bring the cluster to completion. However, we have the first upgrade, which is we're going to add uh, what is called a Pi Moroni Blinked. Uh, Pi Moroni is a, an open hardware maker out of uh, England, I believe. They design a number of things uh, which are custom made by them, besides selling hardware made by others like uh, Spark Fun and Adafruit, if you're familiar with the, the various um, um, open hardware or um, uh, open source hardware um, movement um, stalwarts. So these little um, strips attach to the side of the cluster, and you can see them here. Unfortunately, in this particular case, um, this cluster has the, the switch in front of it, which kind of ruins the effect a little bit, but they're so bright, it doesn't really matter. And uh, the point is that you have an array of, um, of uh, LEDs that you can use to signal the state of the, of the board. You can index them individually so that you can uh, attribute different values to them, or you can use them as a single indicator like um, showing, for example, the, the load state of the cluster by showing um, how far that uh, LED bar is lit and, uh, and maybe changing the color of it. It's very easy to program with, uh, with uh, Python libraries, so it's, it's easy to surface the status of the, of the individual cluster nodes. It's kind of cool, and um, what would be the, the point of a cluster if you don't have uh, LED lights? So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, other thing uh, which I don't have a picture of, I think, um, uh, is that uh, the fan that comes with the cluster is a little bit loud. And um, 
the fan is actually perfectly standard, but because of the box of the cluster, it kind of the noise amplifies inside the box. And uh, besides, it's a it's a data center fan, and those things are not designed for noise. Um, it's relatively quiet as far as data centers go, but it's it's loud as far as your desk or your office goes. So I replaced this fan with uh, with uh, an Austrian fan that's designed for gaming rigs and it it runs slightly slower to reduce vibration and then it has very nice bearings and you basically cannot hear it and I'm sitting right next to the cluster right now and, and I cannot hear it. So that's the extent of the assembly. Then we have uh, these short network cables. The other part of the cluster that's interesting is that we have double networking, right? We have the local ethernet networking, but we also have the Wi-Fi because I assembled this with um, Raspberry Pi 4s, which have Wi-Fi. So um, that is actually quite cool in terms of making the cluster portable, as we'll see in a second. Okay, so these are the, um, the four views of the finished cluster nice. once it's fully assembled. Um, slightly bigger versions of this exist with more nodes, and Pico cluster also makes uh, setups with other boards. Um, I think uh, the NVIDIA uh, the NVIDIA boards with um, with CUDA chips are the ones that are the most interesting right now, but um, mm. uh, that's not really relevant so here. So it looks like the switch obscures the LEDs a little bit. Yes, that is uh, that is uh, something that they should really change in a future version because even though they don't sell the the blinked. Uh, oh, that's they, set up things so that uh, that you can use it uh, so they kind of missed that and um, I think that there is enough space that you could move the the switch to the opposite side and and move the power where the switch is just trade spots or um, or potentially um, maybe just move the switch here to the middle so that it doesn't obscure the LEDs um, who knows? That would definitely be an enhancement for a version 1.1 of this cluster. Um, and this is how it looks once it's on. Uh, there are plenty of green LEDs to begin with, uh, but uh, let's see if there is. Um, uh, yeah, I don't have a picture with, uh, oh, with the I light. Oh, like the carrying on. case, yeah. The uh, carrying case I made, uh, I just went on mono price and bought a $12 carrying case. and. Uh, this uh, design was shown at um, scale, uh, the scale conference in, uh, in LA. And so I needed to travel with the cluster. So I made uh, two carrying cases for, for uh, both clusters, the three as a backup and the four. Um, so that, you know, never angered demo gods always have a backup. <laughs> um, and they fit exactly into the, into these cases and the cases have the space for this little logo that I made with the spicing and the spacing guild um, symbols uh, for those of you that have read Dune that I use as a logo on, on a bunch of things. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yes. So um, oh, that's when we arrived at the hotel. So that's probably it in terms of, um, of the cluster itself. If we look at the three cluster, I wouldn't spend too much time on that, but just to give you uh, a view, uh, obviously the stack looks the same, but uh, if we have a picture of the complete assembly, uh, the complete assembly is about half the size because uh, the power supply is external and the switch is external. And so, uh, the older design for Raspberry Pi 3 is half the size and it's um, actually quite cute how tiny it is. And um, th that design didn't come with a switch. So I, I kind of hacked the net gear switch and uh, stuck it on the side and found this right angle connector for the power on eBay. And uh, the result is that it's, it's very, very compact. And obviously the CPUs are not as um, beefy as on the Pi 4. Uh, and it doesn't have as much RAM, but, uh, but in terms of space, um, it's really, really nice and it doesn't require a, a, van, a, a fan for cooling. So 
that also has its um, its place. And most of the talk actually was developed on the three because there was nothing for specific until we get to the supercomputing stuff where actually having uh, plenty of RAM does help. So we've seen the, the assembly and the hardware. Let's uh, look at the software. This is uh, the part which we we'll do with slides. So um, uh, Pico cluster actually has their own system images, which are largely very good. And so I built from those. You could do the same thing from stock Raspbian or from Ubuntu or from a, an ARM friendly Fedora or from uh, Raspbian, I'm sorry, from um, uh, Armbian, the, um, the favorite version of Debian for ARM um, that has all the additional drivers for all the, the SOC boards. Um, the, um, in this case, I started with, um, with the Pico cluster images, but this would work pretty much anywhere. And the idea is, um, well, uh, obviously you set up users and you want to have your private user to run the code unprivileged and you want to uh, obviously have root access. But um, because we started from the initial system images, I'm showing how to rename the user and also, um, well, you need to purge the, the X authority after you do that and clean up a little. But, Ultimately, whichever way you do it, you set up the users so that you have uh, a user for you and a root user just in case you get locked out. Um, and obviously, uh, because of the way things are going to play out, you want no password. Uh, you want uh, pseudo um, escalations so that you can uh, execute commands uh, as uh, administrator from your uh, unprivileged user. Um, should I go full screen here? Let's see, because maybe I'm yeah, making can, the... that'd be cool. It's, I can see it fine. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do that. Oops. I summoned the control bar right at the wrong time. There we go. So, um, The, the system images um, from um, Pico cluster come in default uh, desktop mode and um, obviously so does Raspbian. So switching to the um, system D world equivalent of an init three mode makes sense. You don't really need, um, you don't really need to have um, X running. And it may save you a little bit of, um, of power here. The other thing is, um, in some cases, uh, you still want to have X installed in case you're, you're distributing an application that has a graphical component, even though you're not looking at it on all nodes. So it, I think it makes sense to have the install done in graphical mode and then switching the individual, um, switching the individual nodes to, um, Terminal. to a uh, terminal so that we don't uh, deal with that. Now let's look at the networking. This is the part that gets a little bit interesting. Um, because we have double networking, uh, the Pico cluster images come shipping with the um, Wi-Fi uh, uh, basically disabled so that it doesn't get in the way. That is annoying because it's a waste of a perfectly good radio. And then the other thing is, I wanted these clusters to be mobile. Um, most of the clusters that we have in the office are obviously stuck in a data center. They can't go anywhere. But these uh, tiny clusters can follow you around. So can we make a cluster set up so that it will work when you arrive at your destination, whether it's a conference or some demo or something. And <coughs> so to deal with that, the double networking is actually a great approach because we can dedicate the ethernet to a fixed IP network. And that's going to make it so that um, your application can rely on fixed IP addressing and it doesn't change. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't interfere in any way with the f because you have changed the location. So uh, that is 
uh, that is making the cluster easy to use. On the other side, um, you have the wireless. That is the part that's going to be adaptive to whichever location you've gone to. And uh, that will just pick up the HCP and let you download packages, install things, and reach the internet if you have to. So this combination works very well. The only thing is that uh, you have to get the routing right. And so uh, in the presentation, I basically documented how to reactivate um, uh, the Wi-Fi without, uh, without breaking the routing. So that basically you need to bring up the interface for Wi-Fi first so that it picks up the default route and then you bring up the, the physical. Otherwise, you could configure the routes yourself manually, but, um, but then you have to go and discover what the default route should look like. In this case, uh, DHCP takes care of it, and, um, and it's um, very smooth. So just the ordering of the interfaces matters here. And uh, if you bring up VLAN uh, first, that will, um, will get you uh, started with a good default route that's adaptive to wherever locale you're at. And the rest, uh, we just um, hard code, and that uh, that should be good enough. Um, um, here, I show it shows how to um, set up the the Wi-Fi from um, from uh, the terminal. Nothing too surprising mm -hmm. here. You're even set up to visit the Red Hat network with the guest password if you want to. Oh, that's convenient. Yeah, but. Um, it's fairly straightforward. I think the only tripping point here is that uh, for new Raspberry Pi cards, um, uh, the first time you have to set up the locale, otherwise for compliance reasons, the Wi-Fi is disabled. Um, it's something about, I thought that at this point in the world, the frequencies for Wi-Fi were the same everywhere, but apparently not. And in any case though, the Raspberry Pi asks that you set the locale first before, uh, before the, uh, the WPA uh, setup works correctly. So interesting catch point when you're building a cluster from scratch. Once you have the network and the users, uh, then you want to have the authentication so that you can use all the nodes from the master node with no, um, or from node zero properly without um, any uh, additional setup. So, there is a little bit of uh, help that uh, the images have in terms of this gen keys uh, script and the SSH import ID uh, command. Um, gen keys on the Pico cluster image set will just take care of everything for you and will distribute the keys everywhere. If you are not on the Pico cluster image set, you can pretty much do the same using SSH import ID. Um, and um, but the cool thing about SSH import ID is that you can give access to somebody whose keys you don't have directly. So you can say SSH import ID uh, for somebody's username on GitHub or for somebody's username on Launchpad and it will go and fetch their public key from GitHub and give them access. So it's, it's a good way to add uh, users without having a lot of emails, give me your key. Uh, and then go put it in manually. It will just uh, pull it from, from the interwebs. That's a nice trick. And uh, these, this is the summary of the scripts that come from the Pyco cluster image set. So restarting all nodes, a clean stop so that the images don't get corrupted, which is not that hard to do when you pull the power on, on a Raspberry Pi and uh, a resize script to resize the images to the size of, uh, of the SD cards. So nothing too surprising. Um, if you rename the users like I have, you have a little bit of, um, of uh, adjusting of the scripts to do. And then uh, the other thing that, uh, that I like doing is moving these into a bin directory um, rather than uh, keeping them sitting in the root um, just for cleansiness. And pretty much every um, every um, oh I don't have the external screen set up here, so I'll have to do it like this. Um, um, pretty much every Debian derivative assumes that you may have a bin directory in your home, so it uh, if you just create bin, you don't have to uh, to add it to path or everything. 
uh, Raspbian checks for it to be there. Um, and uh, it's in the default path anyway. So you just create it and move, it, move the script there. So here I am connected to node zero of the cluster. And um, as you can see, we pretty much moved, um, moved um, things and cleaned them up in there. Nothing too strange. The, um, oops, the keys don't work in this mode. There we go. So um, the next thing is that uh, you want to have parallel SSH so that you can run the same command across um, across all nodes of the cluster without uh, without having to repeat them umpteen times. So um, I believe on Debian-based distributions, the command is parallel SSH, while on Fedora-based distributions, it's PSSH. I don't know where the history is there. It's pretty much um, the same thing. Um, and uh, the trick here is that you want to have a file like this listing the nodes of the cluster so uh, that you can just call and say um, h nodes and then the command that you want is something like cat etc. Um, hmm. Now the thing that's going to happen here is that uh, this is just going to tell you that the command succeeded. Um, what you want to do in this particular command is that you actually want to see the output. So uh, you have to add the inline to, uh, to get the output of the commands and make it more chatty, um, as we can see here on the slides. Now, another good example of this is, um, is here. Um, We can uh, just, uh, there is Unicode in the slides, so we need to fix that. Um, we can, um, whoops, there is this curious prompt. We can check the connectivity just by sending one, uh, one ping only, um, so to speak. Um, to each of the nodes, and then uh, we can do the equivalent check, which is um, networking with DNS, as opposed to with IP, and check if we have name resolution. In any case, the, the point here is that with parallel SSH, we can run the same command pretty much everywhere. Uh, on the cluster and not having to retype the same thing every time or not having to log in to every node every time. The, um, another nice example that I ran into is that there is, there is actually a temperature sensor in these CPUs. So <coughs> we can check the temperature of the nodes. I never see, thought to uh, do that, that's cool. Okay. See if they're overheating or not. I, I hit on this the other day when I changed the fan because I wanted to see if the 2300 RPM fan. Um, it, it's running slower than the original, which was running as, at 3000 RPM. I wanted to see if uh, the cluster was uh, heating up more, but it, it didn't make any difference. The, um, the fan was oversized to the cluster, even, even uh, just pegging the CPUs, the, the temperature stays the same. So uh, what else? Um, this is just a normal sanity for a cluster. We want to have an NTP time source so that um, uh, at least uh, TLS and, uh, and generally SSL are working. Um, you don't run into these mysterious errors um, which come when, when uh, encrypted connections cannot be established. Um, they are particularly cute when, or they used to be particularly cute when you try to set up the Kubernetes and, uh, and you don't have the time set up correctly. Uh, then um, you get these errors that absolutely made no sense, uh, at least the last time I, I installed Kubernetes. Um, because generally folks are not expecting uh, the, um, uh, the, the SSL library to be failing them uh, for time reasons. And then I think, as usual in, in software, 
the the error handling leaves something to be desired and they're just not um time, time issues are a significant challenge always tls2 yeah. it's not, yeah that's still that's the same thing that's not, yeah so uh, but that's fortunately something easy to fix and so here is the three commands um summary of how to set up time on the cluster then uh, finally setting up an fs shares so we have a slash export directory in uh, in the root and um, we mount it in the root of the node zero and then we mount it on all other nodes and uh, that's how we distribute our binaries so we can invoke them with parallel ssh on all nodes and we can um, we can export them to all nodes using uh, NFS. Uh, the caveat here for uh, new users is that the mount part is probably the most dangerous part of the entire assembly because if you make a typo in FS tab, uh, things go sideways <laughs> very, very sideways. <laughs> yeah. um, and actually, I, at uh, scale, I had exactly that experience because um, uh, I was preparing the second cluster for the demo and uh, and I forgot the tab, I think, or or added an extra. Yeah, I, I, the spacing between parameters wasn't right. So you couldn't, um, you couldn't distinguish the zero from the other zero. It thought that there was a missing parameter and so that cluster wouldn't, uh, the cluster node wouldn't boot anymore. So I had a, a last minute rescue to do in the, in the operations room. Um, but I, just, I guess I just, you can take it as a learning experience. <laughs> I was just writing some code that had to distinguish between partitions on the SD card. And oh my God, I was pulling my hair out. Uh, the <laughs> same type of thing. It's very, very fragile. Uh, yeah, it, it is surprisingly touchy. Um, but that's fine. I mean, I guess it's, it's just that it's not expecting, uh, it's not expecting you to, to um, make errors in the file system mounts. Um, <laughs> Or even have them, yeah. Not too, not too unreasonable, I suppose, when this this part of Unix was designed. Um, oh, I see. What you're, yeah, yeah. Just in general, that's a trick. Yeah. yeah it's a trick. Beyond that, I think the the thing is, um, uh, the most fragile part of the cluster will be the SD cards because that's um, that's basically the the wake point of the of the stack. So. If one is using things um, in a more permanent fashion, maybe using USB keys will be more reliable than, than doing SD cards. Um, but yeah, that's um, straightforward enough. And this is uh, showing how to drive the, the, the LED uh, lines, so the, the, the blinked. Um, it's just a Python library, so pretty straightforward. Um, I added one script of mine, uh, which is this clear all script, because we're calling the, uh, the Python um, executables to call the, the to display uh, the LED status using parallel SSH. And so when you control C it, sometimes they die a little bit too abruptly and you may get residual lights being on or residual lights still flashing. So I added one more script that basically goes and, and turns them all off if, um, if you have any residual state left. But you can do some pretty cool things. Um, like uh, here, the example is a uh, Larson scanner. So um, there, I don't know if you know the story, there is this uh, Hollywood producer, Glenn Larson. Uh, he was the producer of Supercar and uh, Battlestar Galactica and a lot of other things, I think the A-Team. But in Battlestar Galactica and in uh, Supercar, there is this LED light that scans across things, right? Yeah. So um, a scanning LED light is now known as a Larson scanner. Uh, so, <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> so you can turn your cluster into a little silent to, to check that it's working, I suppose. That's cool. And the other example is there is a CPU load script that you can turn the bar into a into a basically a visual top. And so you can test that with the stress command to create some load on the cluster and see, um, see it visualized. Can you run those things from a container? Cause like I was, I was having this vague idea of like having, you know, a 
little Kubernetes cluster, putting this script in a container, and then, you know, that would show you where, like, does it require special uh, privileges to execute these scripts or? I don't think so. Um, you just okay. have to have the, um, the, the Python library installed in the system, but, uh, okay. but I'm not running them as root. So it doesn't look like it's privileged. Okay. And uh, the, the, the LED bar is mounted on top of the, um, of the mm, I'm forgetting the term now, the, the pin board on the, mm -hmm. on the Raspberry Pi, what is it called? The, um, uh, there is oh, this right. pin riser, the pin riser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And it, it, it looks it's like, like they make one that slides to the side so that you'd be able to get, um, like it doesn't, like it doesn't, uh, take over the pins like because I was looking looking up the hmm. the LED bar and the blanket like goes right on top but they have another variant that um, slides through oh nice and, um, yeah, the, the, it's the more default, expensive I don't know if it's more expensive the default is that it it runs on top uh, for the array um, for the for the cluster I got a 90 degree uh, extension to the connections of the riser so that they are on the side of the cluster and uh, those are very okay. cheap. They're like ninety cents per uh, per riser um, adapter, but uh, but you're still taking on all the pins. Um, and then there may be something else that that just takes on a couple of pins because it's really not using all the all the Raspberry Pi um, uh, shield or cape. I forget what the, um, the add-on board term for Raspberry Pi is. Um, um, what do you mean? Uh, each one of these boards oh, has like its the own shields. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes for they Arduino call shields. shields for uh, for um, um, for BeagleBone, it's Cape, and I don't know to remember what it is for a Raspberry Pi. GPIO headers. Michael, you should be able to talk if you want, but he's and you had he had a question too um, about the Turing Pi. I haven't looked at Turing Pi at all. Is that is that uh, based on the the Raspberry Pi models or is it? Let's see. Oh, this is actually okay. It's a seven. That's cool. It's a it's a seven Pi cluster on a ATX um, motherboard. It's like nanos. Here, I can give you a link to it if you want. I've been look. I've been. We've been playing with a ton of these these things. There you go. I haven't, but let's see. Seven so node Kubernetes cluster ATX form factor. Nice. Okay, and that's the motherboard, and I assume then the pies, you buy the pies separately. Oh, and this is using the module. Yeah. The module? What do you mean? The, the Raspberry Pi module. Oh, okay. So it doesn't have the, the pins, it just has a... Okay, so it's still a full Pi. It's just designed as a as a module that you can yeah. slot. Nice. There is a uh, there is a similar design uh, out of the Pineboard team, and they have uh, the Pineboard modules pretty much done the same way, and that uh, that became available last year. I guess Turing Pi is doing the same with with Raspberry Pi, which is going to be a little bit more mainstream. Um, I think, especially if the Pi for um, CPU with, with eight uh, gigs of RAM that was announced uh, a couple of days ago becomes available as a module, that would be quite interesting. Yeah, I'm is basically twice as powerful as the CPU of the of the Pi 3. Yeah, and uh, and then if you get four, uh, if you get um, four gigs of RAM as we do now, it's Pretty cool because it's it's basically making Kubernetes comfortable. But um, but uh, with eight gigs, you could actually uh, do something useful. Sorry. There's a guy who's doing a whole series about bringing up Kubernetes on these things. 
Alex Ellis. I'm, I'm looking to get him to come and talk about OpenFast. <laughs> um, and if you, we've been doing uh, stuff uh, called edgelab.digital, which um, is a, I like, I like some of the build, build stuff you're doing, but a lot of the, we actually switched into Netboots and uh, you can fully automate the, uh, the operational install for all the, all the nodes, but it takes, you have to, you, you give up a Pi. In your model, every Pi is in use. In ours, Pi Zero, what we call Pi Zero is, the, is a gateway and it provides the automation hub and networking hub and things like that. This is cool. I like the blink lights. Oh. So the last 